give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, I ask that you come and go with us to the Gospel of St. Matthew. The Gospel of St. Matthew, that 16th chapter. The Gospel of St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. We're going to ask you to stand and show reverence to God's word. The Gospel of St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Let your fingers do the walking down to that 24th verse. If you found it, say amen. amen. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul, or to lose their soul, as King Jimmy would say it? Or what can anyone give, or what would a man give in exchange for their soul? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. We'd like to speak to you from a thought today. I'm going to ask you a question. Why are you in it? Why are you in it? It's a good question. Why are you in it? When we were in school, we joined certain clubs, certain, got on certain teams to become a part of. And many times we had various reasons for getting into them and, and all were not for the right reasons. For example, I played football in school and and it wasn't because I, I, I like football, but it was because of the benefits. Hey, amen. Because people loved you if you played football, especially in South Georgia. They, they love you if you play football. The principal loved you. Your teachers loved you. Your fellow students respected you and younger students idolized you and you had it going on all because you were in it. You know, on Fridays when you wore those jerseys, boy, you were the stuff because you were in it. A amen. There was once a major credit card company that had a slogan a few years ago that said membership has its privileges and I can remember how when I was a part of the football team how how the girls loved football players amen some some of y'all some of y'all can remember that a amen a amen I, 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 the better you were especially if you were starting and got your name called out a little bit the better you were the more girls you could get. Y'all brothers must didn't play football when y'all in school. Y'all ain't got no brother in here that played football in there. Y'all can't relate. It don't seem like y'all can relate. Hey, amen. S some of the ugliest guys would have some of the prettiest girls and then make you look at the couple and say, how in the world? See, some of y'all look at married couple now and wonder how in the world did he get her? A amen. 
And he would not be the only one benefiting, but she would be benefiting also. Because she would be in it because it gave her prestige and it gave her status for dating the starting quarterback or being the girlfriend of the starting linebacker. And the whole point that I'm trying to make this, 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 to this scenario is that many times we get into things or we get involved in groups or in organizations for the wrong reasons. Amen. So I presented a question to you today. Why are you in it? Why are you in it? Let's look at some reasons why people get into things. When we, when we see children, when we see children getting into things, why do children get into things? One reason is because their friends are part of it and they want to follow. Some, some kids don't even have to like some stuff, but if little Johnny getting in there, I'm going in there too. If little Susie is a part of it, mama, I want to do it too because Susie, my Susie mama going to let her do it too. A amen. Amen. Some children are in it because their parents placed them in it. You're going to sing in the children choir. And they get up there looking like this. But they get in it because their parents place them in it. Sometimes children get into things because it gives them pleasure. I want to be a part of this because I like doing this. So, sometimes, sometimes children get into, that, into things because it will benefit the club or the team. Amen. I can add two to make it better. Amen. Look at jobs. Why do people get into certain jobs? The first, the number one reason they get into certain jobs because of pain. I got a light bill. I got a gas bill. I got a house payment and a car payment. So I need a job. So I'm going to get into a job so it can pay my bills. A -a -a Amen. Some people get into jobs because of positions and titles. I want you to call me the president. I want you to call me the chairman. I want you to call me the principal or I want you to call me coach. Amen. Some people get into certain jobs because they can't find nothing else. Some people graduate with college, graduate from college with master degrees and they can't even find a job with the degree in which they got. And because they got student loans to pay back, they got to take whatever comes along. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. A amen. So somebody, some people take jobs because it's what they want to do. A amen. I, I, I look at I, I look at um, I, I look at morticians a lot of times. You, you got to be a special person. <laughs> look at Joe. Look at Joe. Joe look at Ron, Joe like, wait a minute. You got you got you, you got to be a special person to want to work with dead folk. Some people want to do that. Amen. Amen. Look, look at relationships and look at marriages. Why do people get into relationships and marriages? Some people get into relationship and marriages for financial benefits. This joker got a good job, so I'm gonna latch on to him. He got benefits, so I'm gonna latch on to him. Some some people get into relationship because of social status. Amen. Because his name is up there in lights, I'm gonna be on his arm a as his trophy. Yeah, y'all went, y'all women ain't saying too much of that. <laughs> Amen. Some people get into relationship to be removed from something worse. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. Because little Johnny couldn't do it for me. I'm going over here with Tom. Uh -huh. Amen. And then some people get into relationship or marriages for this crazy reason called love. So why are you in it? Even in church, folks get into different positions and auxiliaries for many reasons. Even in church, everything should be done to the glory of God. 
Paul says in Romans 12, and I'm going to say this again. I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, he said, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Paul is saying if you're in it, if you're in it for any other reason than Christianity and to give God glory, then you are in it for the wrong reason. Are y'all going to talk to me in here? Ecclesiastes 12 tells us our whole duty, why we need to get in it or why we're in it. Ecclesi Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12 and 13, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. He said, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Our duty, why we should be in it, is to fear God, respect God, reverence God, and to keep his commandments. Are y'all are y'all with me? But even in the church, we have positions, we have we have titles in the church, and and and, and folks get into these or receive these, and you need to ask the question sometimes. Ask yourself, why are you in it? Look, look at look at ministers. Look at ministers. Many, many ministers have preached their initial sermon only. And some hadn't gone anywhere else. And they're satisfied. As long as they get the opportunity to sit right here, they good. Hey, hey y'all ain't saying nothing. Hey, Amen. Some misunderstood their calling. We have preachers preaching and God didn't call them to preach. Somebody told them they look like a preacher. So they get in it because somebody said you look like, you sound like, you walk like, you talk like. So they decided to get in it. Some say that I heard God say in my head, minister and since I heard the word minister I guess God meant for me to be a minister well when you heard minister God might be talking to you to minister to your wife or minister to your husband or minister to your family amen somebody a amen sometimes they get in it because they want to be out front or sit where everybody can see them. Some ministers get in it because they want to have that prefix in front of their name. I, I, know, I know some preachers don't call them by their first name unless you put reverend in front of it. Because you say, hey, Tom. No, it's, it's Reverend Smith to you, sir. <laughs> and, and don't let them go to cemetery. I mean, seminary. And get a little piece of paper hanging on the wall. You might call him, what's up, Pastor? Oh, it's Dr. Pastor here. And they get in it because they want to be looked up to and think folks will feel when they make themselves feel important. Some ministers get into it to make money by fleecing the flock. What can I get from this congregation? Because if I tell them what they want to hear, I can pay off my house. If I tell them what they want to hear, I can drive a nice car. If I tell them what they hear, I can wear the best clothes and the best jewelry. They love fleecing the flock. So why are you in it? 
preachers. Why are you in it? Amen. Look at our deacons. Why are you in it? Why, 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 you know, we, we have deacons that don't even know what they're supposed to be doing. Amen. 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 They, they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they, they, they just asked me to get up here and, and, and that's why I'm here. But, but see, they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. They got the title and yet as long as they're sitting at the right hand of the pastor, they all right. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Because uh, half of them don't know your job is not in here. Your job is outside. Yes, you were called as church administrators, but not on the inside, but to take care of what's going on on the outs. Amen. Ain't getting quiet. We're going to be mighty quiet. Everybody in here after that. Some deacons are in it because they were asked to be and they reluctantly accepted the task. But brothers, I want to tell you, if your heart ain't in it, just like drugs, just say no. Uh-huh. We got a lot of deacons that are in it because their daddy was a deacon. Or their granddaddy was a deacon. Uh-huh. Or they got good jobs. And pastor knew if I put them in that position, I know they'll pay real well. Or some of them are deacons because they look like deacons. They shave. They come to church wearing a suit and tie. So let's put them on up here, brethren, and make them deacons. But why are you in it? Look at choirs. Why are y'all up there singing songs of Zion? Why are you doing it? Is it because you want to or is there another reason? What is your purpose of being in the choir? Your purpose is to help usher in the presence of the Lord. Your purpose is to inspire the congregation through song service. Hebrews 13 and 15 says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But too often, choirs want to usher in their own presence instead of God's presence. Don't get mad with me. Don't get mad with me. But a lot of times with choir anniversaries, it's nothing but a glowing show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who can out sing one another. Even when you're marching in. It looked like a Greek step show or something, you know. Why, 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 why are you in it? Why are you in it? It's because two or three, sometimes two or three members feel like the choir is all about them instead of God. Oh, don't have a good voice and let somebody pat you on the back a little bit and tell you that you can sing because you get mad with somebody if they sing. Every hey, once in a while, choir, you should, you should just ask yourself, look in the mirror and ask yourself, why am I in it? Okay, I didn't talk about the preachers. I didn't talk about the deacons. I didn't talk about the choir. Let's talk about everybody else. Let's, let's talk about church membership. 
Why, why are you joining the church? Why, why are you joining the church? Why are you, why are you in it? Why are you join certain churches? Sometimes people join certain churches that they, they get into that church because of the type of members that go there. It's been said that Sunday is the most segregated day of the week. We work together. We can eat together. We go to school together. We go to Walmart together. We go to McDonald's together. We go to the ball game together. But on Sunday morning, white people, y'all go to your church. Black people, y'all go to yours. And Hispanics go to Iglesia. <laughs> but yet all of you are supposed to be serving the same God. But I can't get in it. I can't get in it with you because you're a different color. Mm. Certain churches have certain congregations because certain churches only have professional people in it. You got to be a doctor, you got to be a lawyer, you got to be a teacher, you got to be somebody of status, you got to be a business owner. They go to that church and all the pro folks come to miss them. <laughs> They ain't got good sense out there. We know how to be sophisticated. They need to be in the woods out there. That's why they get in it. Some people join churches or get in churches because of the type of congregation. And some of them, there's a lot of churches that have only young people in it because of the lights and the smoke and the flash and, and the music that's going on and they get into I want to join that church because it's popping and it's hopping over there and they ain't old fogies like them folk over there. They don't know how to praise the Lord. Well, I understand that Jesus still says, I be lifted up. I don't need no lights. I don't need no smoke and mirror. But if you lift me up, I'll draw all men unto me. So why are you in it? Some people are in certain churches because that's where us family always went. Our family name out there on the cornerstone. Cause this is Johnson Tabernacle. And my name is Charlie Johnson, my great great granddaddy. Bought this land from Mr. Joe. So why, 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 why are you here? Why are you in it? Some people are in church because of who their pastor is. Some folks join churches because they have celebrity pastors. I was talking to these folks before. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I was talking to these folks one time, and you know, I said, "Well, I'm, I'm from I'm pastor church in Baxley and stuff like this, and and you know, but my home church is such and such, and my pastor is um, SD Beings out of Augusta, Georgia. You know, where do y'all go to church? Well, we go to World Changers." <laughs> And my pastor is Dr. Creflo Dollar. <laughs> and I want to tell you, baby, Creflo don't know you no more than you know Santa Claus. But... So why are you in it? Why are you here? Why are you in church? Some, some, some of you in church, some folks come to church. I ain't saying y'all. I ain't saying y'all. Some folks go to church. Because of who goes there. I heard there are a lot of single women in the choir. <laughs> Potential wifes. 
Heard there are a lot of single men in that church over there. Her pastor ain't got no wife. Might be a chance to become first lady. I ain't talking about y'all. I ain't talking about y'all. So why are you here? Why are you in it? That's the question we're asking this morning. Why are you in it? When we look at the words of the text, Jesus saying the same thing. Jesus in the text, he tells us what we must do in order to be in it. And if you are not doing these things, you're in it for the wrong reason. Jesus gives us three reasons that three things that we must do in order to follow him and to be a real Christian. Amen. All three of them found in verse 24. Look at what Jesus told his disciples. He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And I'm wondering how many of us have sat down and wondered, what do these three things mean? Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, which is the reason you should be in here, because you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Can I get some help up in here? Amen. 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 So let's go through this. I, I'm going I'm to give you these three things that Jesus says, expound on them a little bit, and then we can go and eat some fried chicken together. Amen. Amen. Look at what Jesus says first. If you're going to get in it, if you're going to be my disciple, he said, first of all, you must deny yourself. Touch your neighbor and tell him you've got to deny yourself. Touch him on the other side. Say, it ain't about you. <laughs> ah! You must reject the natural human inclination toward selfishness. Because some folk feel that church is all about them. They come to see me. They come to see me do my thing. They come to see me say my prayer, raise my hymn, sing my song. But you got to deny yourself. In other words, there must be a willingness to deny oneself of possessions and of status in order to grow in holiness and commitment to God. Denying yourself means sometimes they ain't gonna recognize you. Sometimes they ain't gonna call your name. If they don't put your name in the church anniversary program, well, I was here when the church first started. A a a amen somebody Paul says Paul says in Philippians 3 7 and 8 he said but what things were gained to me those I counted loss for Christ yea doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ he said in order to get Christ in my life nothing else mattered I don't care about the degrees that I got on the wall. I don't care about the bands or the stacks that I might have in the bank. Give me Jesus. This is what Paul said. Jesus is saying that we have to overcome the persistent fleshly demand of the body and bring them into submission to God's word so that we won't give in to sin. Amen. Amen. Pastor didn't call me. I ain't coming to church. I ain't coming to church no more. Who you depending on, pastor or God? Amen. 
Nobody even say anything to me. They don't speak to me when I go to church. You going to get the word. You ain't going for folk to speak to you. It ain't about you. When you deny yourself, it means that everything is all about God. A amen. I'm going to say amen all by myself. Because when you get caught up thinking it's about you, you're about to mess up in sin. Because when you start thinking it's about you, pride is going to set in. If I stay home, if I don't go to choir practice, if I don't get up there, I boy, I know they feeling going to be hurt. That's proud and arrogance. Amen, somebody. That is a sin. Greed comes in when you don't deny yourself. Greed, greed comes in when you can't deny yourself. You know, I, 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 I can do this over here, even though it goes against God's word. But boy, I can make a lot of money. <laughs> uh uh huh. A -a Amen. Amen. Jealousy comes in when you don't deny yourself. Yes. Uh huh. Jealousy comes. I've known many preachers that if somebody else is preaching and don't let the congregation be acting a fool and saying amen and just, that, that preacher will sit right there and just look at him. But when it's his turn, he expect everybody to fly over pews and all this. That's jealousy and envy. Oh, yeah. All right, y'all still saying amen. Okay. Paul tells Galatians 5 and 4, he says, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. In other words, every day you wake up, you got to crucify this flesh. Every day you wake up, you need to tell yourself, it ain't about me. So you got to deny yourself. Not only do you have to deny yourself, Jesus says you got to take up your cross. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone. And there is a cross for me. So what is this cross? What is this cross? See, you, you, you have to be willing to die to self. See, Christians today view the cross, everybody wearing their cross around their neck. They get tattoos of crosses. They have crosses in the glass corner up there and, and got crosses sitting, you know, on their mantle and all this stuff. And it's a cherished symbol of atonement and forgiveness and God's grace and his love. That's what they look at the cross. But, but in Jesus' day, but in Jesus' day, the cross represented the most painful and and torturous and humiliating death known to mankind to be hung on the cross you were the most wretched criminal that ever lived and here jesus is saying you got to take up your cross so what is jesus saying when jesus made this statement it was a call to self-abasement which means humility and also self-sacrifice, which means giving up yourself. You got to be willing to die in order to become his disciple. But I know y'all gonna get quiet when I said that. Rick, I knew they were gonna get quiet when I said it. In order to be Jesus' disciple, you got to be willing to die. Dying to self is an absolute surrender to God. Yes, yes. So Paul says, I told you I was going to remind you, as Paul says in 12, Romans 12 and 1, he said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, to sacrifice yourself means that you have to give up all rights to yourself so that God can use you for his service. Taking up your cross and getting in it means you ain't got nothing to do with what Jesus makes you. Ooh, boy. Taking up your cross or presenting yourself as a sacrifice 
it's not going to be pretty. So you don't get in it to look good. Taking up your cross means that you have to have a level of commitment to Jesus Christ that may cost you your very life. People were killed following Jesus back then. Let me say it again. People died following Jesus back then. And when Jesus said, take up your cross, that means that it can cost you your very life. Okay, let me, let, me, let me help you feel better. Let me help you feel a little bit better. It may not be your physical life. I got, I got two or three amens out of that. But it may cost you your family. Following Jesus can cost you your family. It can cost you your finances. It can cost you your friends. Amen, somebody. It can cost you your job. It can cost you your reputation. That's your livelihood. So the question is now, what are you willing to lose to become his disciple? Matthew 19, Jesus was teaching and a young man came to Jesus. He said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, why you call me good? There's none good but the father. He said, okay, Lord, what, what, what must I do? He said, you got to keep the commandment. He said, which one? He said, don't commit adultery. Don't, don't bear false witness. Don't covet our neighbor. All these, he said, you do this. And the man said, oh, good. Lord, I've done all these from my youth up. And he should have left it alone. But yet he asked one more question. He says, what else do I lack? <laughs> Jesus told him, well, if you want to be perfect, Sell all that you have, give to the poor, and follow me. If you want to be perfect, sell everything you got, give to the poor, and follow me. The Bible says that this joker had a lot, but he went away shaking his head. I know King James said he went away sorrowful. That's shaking his head because he had a lot. So how much are you willing to give up to get in it? Jesus says it's hard for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God because he don't want to give up what he got. So in order to get in it, are you willing to give up what you got? Okay, all right, y'all mad at me. You got to deny yourself. You got to take up your cross. And then the third thing he said, you got to follow me. You can deny yourself. It's all right. Don't be selfish. You take up your cross. Yeah, you look, you look like you're doing stuff you need to do. Take up your cross. You got to work a little bit. And then he said, follow me. That's one of the hard parts right there. Following Jesus. You you have to be fully committed. Let me say that again. You have to be fully committed to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Fully committed. Commitment to Christ means taking up your cross daily. Giving up your hopes, giving up your dreams, giving up your possessions, and even your very life, if need be, for the cause of Christ. Do you have to be poor to be a Christian? No. Paul says, I I, I want you to prosper just like I want your soul to prosper. Amen. Amen. No, you don't have to be poor to be a Christian or to be saved. Amen. But don't let that money be your God. Don't let that money keep you out of the kingdom because you're not willing to give it up. Amen. If only if you willingly deny yourself and take up your cross, will you be called his disciple? Jesus says in Luke 14, 27, he says, and whosoever doth not bear his cross, and come after me cannot be my disciple. 
Now I want to tell you today, it's not easy following Jesus. It is not easy being a Christian. It is not easy following you. If somebody says easy living a saved life, they lie to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, amen. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 5 and 11, he said, blessed are ye when men revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You're going to go through some mess when you follow Jesus. Amen. Jesus says in Matthew 10 and 22, he said, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. He says in John 15 and 20, he said, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they'll also persecute. So if you can't be be, if you can't take being talked about, lied on, criticized, why are you in it? Why, why are you in it? My brothers and sisters, the hurry to a close, it's not going to be easy on this Christian journey. There are going to be some ups and downs. There are going to be some heartaches and disappointments. There's going to be some troubles and some trials. There's going to be some criticisms and some ridicule. There's going to be some good days. And there's going to be some bad days. But I come to encourage you today not to jump ship. I come to you, encourage you to stay in the ship. Remember last week we talked about saved through broken pieces. Stay in the ship. So to answer the question, if I were to take a poll of each one of you today and ask why are you in it? The answer to this question is between you and the Lord. But I can tell you why you should be in it. And one reason you should be in it it's because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus came, lived, and died for sinners just like you and I. They nailed him on a hill called Calvary as he hung there on an old rugged cross. His blood ran down and, and I'm so glad that his blood covered all of my sins. Can I get some help in here? Yeah. And because of what Jesus did, it gave us a right to the tree of life. Yes, and because I'm glad that Jesus died for me, that I might live, that's why I'm in it. Yes. Is there anybody in here who's in it because Jesus died for you one day? Yes. Amen. But there's also another reason why I'm in it. I'm also in it because one day, I'm going to quit this busy walk of life. One day, I'm going to preach my last sermon. One day, I'm going to close my Bible for the last time. One day, I'm going to take my last breath on this side of the river. Amen. And because I was in it unto death. When I transitioned from death to life. I'm going to be able to see Jesus' face. Can I get a witness in here? In other words, one day I'm going home to be with the Lord. And the thing about the home where I'm going to, there'll be no more dying. No more crying. No more sickness. No more pains and heartaches. No more trials and tribulations. I'm going home to live with the Lord. 
Is there anybody in here today that has made up your mind that you're going to stay in this thing? That you're going to hold on to God's unchanging hand? Because one of these days, if you stay in it long enough, you'll hear Jesus say, well done. Well done. Thy good and faithful servant. Come on up. You've been faithful over a few things. Take your rest. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Come on and give the Lord a hand clap of praise.